So I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the Pine language. One of the nice things about Pine is you can forget everything that Simon told you this morning. Pine does all that for you. Also, don't worry about taking notes. I'm going to only do a couple of toy examples, and we've already snuck the code onto your machines. So the code I'm showing you now is already on your machines. It's in the intro lab. So <coughs> I'm also basically going to concentrate on the code. I'm not going to try to teach you any of the biology or the neural networks or anything like that below you, beyond them. So basically, what we're trying to do is emulate spiking neural networks. And as most of you will know, the brain is, co is a, co a whole bunch of different neurons. They're connected together. And in our model, in the spiking neural network, they're connected together by spikes. Spikes are just little bits of information saying, at such and such a time, a spike happened. That's literally all a spike is. It's a single message. There's no data to the spike other than where it's come from. And so we use the Pine language. Why do we use the Pine language? Because it's a, it's a, com it's a language that is supported by the various different projects inside of uh, HPP. So the Nest project, the brain, the neuron, obviously the Spinnaker boards. They each support generally the Pine language. Unfortunately, each one supports a different subset of the total pine. So it's not guaranteed that just because it runs on one, it will automatically run on another. I think the toy examples we have here will run on all of the platforms, at least those that support Pine 8. So my, my first toy example, I'm gonna, it's going to be very simple. It's going to be two populations. Each population is going to be one neuron big. We're simply going to have a spiking source array, which at time zero is going to send one spike. And we're going to have a if cur x model, which will simply build up over time until the voltage gets to a high enough level that it spikes. It will send a spike and then drop back down again. So it's a toy example, but it's enough to show you some of the, the things you need to do to run um, in Pine. So the first thing you need to do is import Pine. You can either do it using Spinnaker, import Spinnaker 8, or most of you, you can, you'll also see a lot of the examples have import pine.spinnaker. So it's actually under the hood exactly the same. I use this one just to show that it actually is Spinnaker 8. And on my machine, I've got both 7 and 8 installed simultaneously. But I need a virtual environment to do that. But Unless you really need both at the same time, don't worry about it. You can just use either this import or the pine.spinnaker. Both are exactly the same. Then the first thing we do is we set up the system. Just spine.setup, and we tell it at what time step to run. Time steps are in milliseconds. So we're telling it to run one time step for every millisecond in your model. Next thing we do is we create the population. So we say spine.population. You tell it how many neurons you want in your population. In this simple toy example, I've got one. You could have several thousand neurons in your population. It really doesn't matter. You tell it what kind of population you want. The Spinnaker comes with a lot of built-in populations, if X being one of them. And then we always suggest you give it a label later for graphing or so. Then if you're plotting the graph, then that's the label you give it. The, the second population we need is our input population. In this case, we're using a simple spike source array. And a spike source array literally just takes an array of input times. And at every time it reaches one of those times, it sends a spike into the system. And again, we just gave it a label. Then obviously, having two populations, unless we actually connect them together, doesn't really mean anything. So in the, for that, we use a projection. In the projection, you have to say, where is it coming from? Our input pop one. Where is it going to? It's going to our pop one. Then you have to tell it, how do you want to connect it? There are various different connectors available. The simplest one is simply the one-to-one. -one. You're saying neuron one from pop input to neuron one of output, neuron two to neuron two, neuron three to neuron three, until one of the two populations runs out of neurons. 
and then we have to give it a synapsis type where we define the, the weight and the delay. The weight basically says how much this spike will affect the spike on the model. Here I've used a high weight of 5, which is enough for one single spike to come in to actually cause the, vol the voltage to go up high enough to spike again. If you've got a lot of uh, spikes coming in from different places, you might use a different weight. And the other one is the delay. How long does it actually take for the signal to reach the new, the, the, uh, the second population? One being the fastest is, we fire it the first time step, and then the next time step it arrives. Arrives, it will then start doing work. Doesn't mean that it's immediately re the next one spikes. It may take time depending on your model underneath. And then we have to ask it what kind, have to tell it what kind of data that it should actually be recording. In this simple example of asking to record the spikes and the voltage. And then we'll plot those later. And then we ask it, tell it how long to run. I'm saying run for, for 10 milliseconds. And then we basically tell it, now go ahead and run for these 10 milliseconds. And it's actually in the run phase that Spinecker does most of the work. So while you're doing, pop, while you're doing all these creation of populations, it, it's recording it, but actually all of the work done, so all of the work that Simon was talking about before of doing the mapping, deciding where to go, which C code to bring in, how to route them all together, how to time them, all that's done under the hood for you. You've probably already seen it when you're doing your codes, it said so long to do this, so long to do that, so long to do that, so long to do that. You'll have seen all this, the progress bars for all of the steps. So, and again, I think most of you by now have seen the need to set up your configuration file. So then, the last thing you need to do is get the data back out again once you've run. In this simple example, we will get both the spikes and the V out. One of the interesting things about uh, Pine from version 8 onwards is that it returns its data in what's called a NEO object. And a NEO object, is, there's, there's a lot of complexity under the hood. I'm not even going to try to explain here. For, for today, important thing to know is how to get the spikes back out again. So we say neo.segment0. That is because a NEO object can actually store data from various runs in one object. You can actually say run, run, reset, run, run again, and it'll give you two segments. For today, just grab seg segment 0, and then you can get the spikes data out, which is in the form of a spike train, or you can get the V data out. And the easiest way to that is to do a filter where the name is V. Again, because filter returns you a list, just grab the zero. Even if it's the only element, you still need to grab that element out of the list. And then ideally close down your simulation. That just does some cleanup on your board. And then we need to plot the data. Uh, the, the Pine utility comes, Pine offers us a couple of utilities to help you with the plotting. You can also do other maths, but in this example, I'm just showing you the so plot figure is a multi is a, is a figure where you can put in any number of different panels you want. And then there's the, the actual panels where you can give it labels, data, uh, whether you want to have the ticks, whether you want to have the Y. Just about anything that works on a matplotlib axis can go in here as a parameter. So in this case, I've given it the voltage, I've given it the spike data, I've given it a, a title and annotate it. And then we use matplotlib show to show it. And we come up with two simple plots. Of course, the diagram in the top is not part of the plot. So in the, in the top one, you can see this is the blue neuron. You can see how it received the tick, the spike at, the at tick one, was fired at zero, received at one because of the delay of one. You see the if cur x slowly building the voltage up. Because of the weight of five, there's actually enough weight behind that one spike to get you to the critical voltage where it spiked, I think it's at time seven. At that point, you see it's fired the spike, and then its voltage drops back down again. 
exactly how each model behaves depends on which model you choose. And then in the second one, we've seen it spiked once. Because of the simple model, you could run it for a thousand, you'd never get another spike out of the system. So really, if you see, you know, I dare to go back, that's all the code you need to run a neural network. Everything else is taken care of. A couple of the limitations on the Spinnaker board, the way it's set up is that you can run a maximum of 255, 256 neurons on each of the cores. But even on a four node board, we just did the calculation, you could get up to about 16,000 neurons on one board. You can, a, a single population can have more than 256 neurons in it. The Spinnaker will automatically then split it up between the different cores, will do the connections for you all under the hood, you don't need to worry about that. So normally we just connect the two up. We do have a, a limitation at the moment that the way the system is, we can only have a delay up to 16 directly. If you specify a delay of more than 16, we'll automatically add another neuron in between that you won't see, which does nothing else than capture the, sp the spike hold on to it for so long, and then send it back out again then the l down the line. But obviously that will use up some of the cores to do that. So if you find all of a sudden, why am I running out of cores with high delays, that could be one of the possibilities. If you're not running out of neurons, you don't need to worry about this. Another thing uh, we, we do allow you is to specify the number of, the maximum number of neurons you want on one core. So we, we try with some um, cost models to define what's the maximum number that could fit on a core. It doesn't always work completely. If you find your stuff is timing out of things, you can request it to put less neurons on a core. Or if you want to see more routing going on on the hood, you can define the maximum number. I'm not guaranteeing that you'll get all 100 on if you ask for 100, but that's the maximum that we'll put on. And that's for each type of neuron you do. So you can define different maximum neurons per neuron type that you put on. The other thing, uh, some of you might have noticed in your configuration file something called a time scale factor. Normally Spinnaker tries to run at real time. So if you say you know, you're running time steps of, of one millisecond, it tries to complete each of these time steps in exactly one millisecond. So as you see the real time and the sim time are running equally. You can set the time scale factor to 10, which would give Spinnaker a lot more time to execute. So if you, you start getting quite complicated models that it just cannot execute all of the models before the next tick arrives, you can increase the time step. Of course, that will slow your model down. It will no longer be in real time. So, okay. The, the second example I'm going to show you is a slightly more complicated example. In this case, we have both an excitatory node and an inhibitory node because a spike can work two ways on your model. The spike can either excite, say, oh, increase your voltage based on this spike, or a spike can decrease your voltage. An inhibitory, say, hey, don't react. So we'll show you the, the two different projections that, that happen. So in this model, we're creating four populations, the blue, the exhibitory, the red inhibitory, and two simple spike nodes to start off each of the uh, populations. So again, the input statements, the first three we've seen before, the fourth brings in a random distribution provided by Pine. And then we set a couple of parameters. In this case, we want a thousand neurons, of which 800 will make excitatory and 200 will make inhibitory and we're going to run it for a bit longer, a sim time of a thousands. And in this case, we're actually going to try to set it up to run a bit fat, to, to run actually at you know, 0.1 of a millisecond. The whole so the first thing we do is create the four populations. These are exactly the same. The first two we've seen before, except instead of putting one we now actually tell it how many neurons to put in each population. 
The second two, we're using a, instead of saying exactly we want, want to specify when we want the spikes to come into the system, we're using a random, a Poisson-based random distribution here. So we're saying we want a spike source Poisson and a rate of about 10% of the time. And we've given them all labels. Then we, again, we're doing projections. Here we're using a slightly different projection. Instead of saying one to one, we're doing a random. So we're saying 0.1 of the time, connect every neuron in population input to population output, but only 10% of the time. So random. So every time you run this particular experiment, you'll get slightly different results because of the random factor. And so we've got the two blue ones are exhibitory. They will increase the volume in the population. The two red ones are inhibitory. They will decrease the population. So again, you can, if you want to play with this, change the, the probabilities and see how that changes your model. To, to start the whole model off, we connect up the two spikes. Again, here we're saying, instead of defining exactly what the delay is, we're saying we want a random delay, somewhere between 1 and 1.6. Remember here we had a time step of 0.1. So saying 1, 1 to 1.6 is about 10 to 16 ticks. We're connecting them one to one. And here we've given it a weight of 2. So I've decreased the weight so that one spike enough in the input isn't enough to trigger the output. You actually need a combination of spikes for the model to work in this case. And I've just connected those up. Again, instead of starting each population at you know, 0.5, you know, the, at the flat baseline, which you saw in the first model, here I'm actually starting each, of the popu each neuron with a random value in the range that makes sense, the voltage between minus 65 and minus 55. And in this case, I just, I'm just going to record the spikes on the blue. I can record whichever one I want. In this case, I'm just interested in the spikes on the blue population. And I run it. And then I plot it very much in the same way. In this case, just the one panel. And you see a, a variety of, of the plots, the spikes, which happened. And if you take your model, if you play with the weights, if you play with the delays, you'll see different weights coming out, different number of spikes coming out. The third one we're going to talk about a little bit about plasticity. My colleague is going to talk a lot more about plasticity, so I'm not even going to try to explain the maths behind it. If you really want to know, Michael here is our math guru. <laughs> he can explain all the maths behind uh, plasticity. The main thing to note here is that we have model one, population one, which we sort of think is, those are the ones we think are causing the effects and model two are the ones being affected. So we want to measure how much a spike in one is sort of a predictor for a spike in two. So we create a, a plasticity model. And the closer one spikes just before two, the more important we consider that. And we also consider the negative. If, spike, if model one spikes just after model two, then that's not a cause. And one obviously is not causing two, so we'll decrease the weight. And again, the closer the two happen together, the more we decrease the weight. So in, the, in this model, again, we have, the we have two populations. Population one, which we think is causing. Population two, which is the one which we think is the effect. At the bottom, we have three input ones. I'll get back into that. And the, the two outside one are what we call noise. They're just randomly generating spikes, different spikes into the, the two populations. The one in the middle, which will run for part of the time, is the training data, which will put, put a lot of spikes into the system with a delay of 1 for the cause and a delay of 10 for the effect. So it'll create sort of training. It's like, hey, it is actually happening 9 milliseconds afterwards. So the the plasticity model will start going, there obviously is a link here because I'm seeing a lot of spikes shortly after the second one. Oh, okay, let's go. 
So again, we do the imports. In this case, I've decided to use 100 neurons in each of my models. I'll, I'll run it for 5,000. I'm setting it up to run at the normal speed of one millisecond. I create my four populations. The two at the bottom, the, the, the two main ones, again, I'm just using the if cur x. I'm calling it pre and post for the, the pre population, the post which defines it. I'm creating my two noise. Again, a Poisson distribution saying, you know, a rate of about 10%. Simple names, noise, pre and post. And I'm going to record spikes both on my pre and my post population. Then I have my training data. And my training data, I'm going to give it also a high spike rate of 10. But I'm only going to start it at tick 15,000, or time step 15, you know, 1,500. And I'm going to run it for 1,500. And then it's going to stop generating spikes. And you'll see that in the final projection where that definitely happens. Then I, I connect them up. So I connect the pre-noise up with a weight of 2. Post noise up again with a weight of two, so it takes a number of spikes in the noise to actually create a spike in the system. Where in the training data, I'm giving it a higher weight of five. I really want my populations to spike when they get training data. The one because of the delay, nine milliseconds before the other ones. So that the plasticity model, which we add here, actually gets it. So the plasticity model, I've got a timing rule. So I can set some factors on, on what kind of timing rule, so how wide those two curves I showed at the beginning should be. I give it a weight rule, so I say, in this case, start, you know, go up to a weight of five. And we saw in the very first model, a weight of five is enough that a spike in the first will automatically cause a spike in the second. And it can drop down to zero if it really cannot find. And then I, I give it the, the model, saying use that timing rule, that weight rule. And again, I've given it a weight and delay to start off. So it's starting off with a weight of zero. Unless we train it up, there will be no connection. And the delay of about five. And then I'm giving it a one-to-one -one connection. So I'm saying for each number one in pre, connect to number one in post. Number 65 in pre, connect to number 65 in post. And then I run the thing. Oh. And then I, again, with the pre-neos, I get the, the neo object out for the spikes. And I get the neo object out for the variables. And the other thing I get out is actually the final weights that the STP model had which I've, I've printed a slightly simplified version here. And you see that in a lot of cases, it's gone up to the maximum five, that it's, it's actually found a, a pre and a post. In some of them, it hasn't found those. So if I plot the spikes, and in this particular one, an interesting one, I've given it a line properties line above. Because I'm giving the same panel multiple data sets, I can actually also set the parameters per data set using what they call a line property. So the color of the first one, I've done red, and I've made those really bad, big. Those are the pre-spikes. And the color of the second one, I've made blue. Those are the post-spikes. So at the first bit on that side of the room, you can see that the spikes are completely random. There's no correlation between the blue and the red spikes. In the middle, the huge training data has come in. There's a really large number of spikes. And they generally happen almost at the same time because that's the way we set it up. And now the interesting thing is when you get to the end and the STDP rule is also firing spikes and you can see that every single time there's a pre-spike, the red, just after that there's also a blue spike. So because the, the weight model is now putting a spike in at a weight 5 high enough, it's causing the, the, the after effect. But the noise model is still coming into the, the blue ones, so there are a lot of blue model spikes still happening, but there's no reverse effect. So an STB model is one way. And as I said before, all of these examples are in the interlab in the learning module.